Today we're going to look at a guitarist from the 70s who bridged the gap between atmospheric, psychedelic tones, and straight up old school blues with his power trio lineup. Can you guess who it is? Well, you already saw the thumbnail on the title, so I'm, I'm guessing yes, you know who it is. Stay tuned for more on the ridiculously underrated and one of my personal favorite guitarists, Robin Trower. Ahoy friends and welcome to another episode of Forgotten Fretmasters, a series where we will shed new light on guitarists and musicians that flew under the radar or didn't have as much commercial success as other musicians who often end up on the top 10 lists. Today we're going to look at a player that I personally have loved ever since I played his album Bridge of Sighs on my dad's 8-track player back in the 80s when I was a kid. Yes, my parents are cool, but that's right. We're going to look at Mr. Robin Trower, in my opinion, an absolute master of control distortion and the owner of an economic yet powerful tone. Remember, if you like videos like this, please consider subscribing to the Guitar Historian channel and be sure to drop a like down below in the video to let YouTube know that you think other classic rock fans would like to see this. But as always, we start at the very beginning. Robin Leonard Trower was born in the Catford section of London on 9 March 1945. Trower also had cool family members, and he picked up the rock and roll bug listening to his older brother's record collection. The first record he recollects noticing the electric guitar on is Elvis Presley's Mystery Train with the legendary Scotty Moore on lead. Over the next year or two, young Robin positively wolfed down rock and roll content wherever he can get it, and he would finally break his parents down, who would buy him a cheap Rossetti Archtop guitar for Christmas. Before long, Robin added his own pickup onto the guitar and figured out how to play it through a radio. He would slowly build his chops, learning Everly Brothers chords and teaching himself all the wonders of the new instrument. By the early 60s, with the dawn of the British invasion, Robin formed his first band called The Raiders. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot on the initial formation of this band, but Robin remembers joining up informally with his big brother Mick on lead vocals and a few friends from school and playing gigs around town at coffee houses and pubs and not taking it too seriously. After a few years and a few lineup changes, this band would eventually morph into Robin's first professional outfit, The Paramounts. Named by the band's manager, the initial lineup would include a super young 14-year-old Gary Brooker on organ and otherwise rotated through a number of drummers, but they would eventually settle enough to record their one and only top 40 hit, a cover of the coaster's Poison Ivy, which would reach number 35 in the UK and punch a ticket for the band to perform on Ready Steady Go in 1965. Following this, though, the band tried their hand at writing some of their own compositions, most notably early songs written by Trower and Brooker, they wouldn't achieve mainstream success and would eventually disband in 1966. The next year, Brooker would begin collaborating with musicians Matthew Fisher and Keith Reed and would produce a single in 1967 called A Whiter Shade of Pale. The single's interesting, classically influenced counter melodies would score a surprising hit for the writers and they would scramble to put a proper band together later that year to replace the session musicians who had filled in on the original recording. Brooker's first call on the telly was his old Paramount's bandmate, Robin Trower, who would join the band that would become Procol Harum in 1967 in time for their follow-up single, Hamburg, which in my opinion is a beautiful and quintessential late 60s gem that really lays the groundwork for the more progressive and adventurous work to come in the early 70s. But despite the instant success that had been enjoyed by Whiter Shade of Pale and Hamburg, the band had trouble in the album charts and their first two albums, Procol Harum and Shine On Brightly, failed to move much in the sales department. 1968 Shine On Brightly, though, would feature some music that was truly ahead of its time and is often cited as an early progenitor of progressive rock, with side two being dominated by the 17-minute In Held Twas In I. Their third album, A Salty Dog, would finally break into the UK album charts as it featured several more radio-friendly compositions, with the title track breaking number 44 in the singles charts and the album itself making it to number 27 in the album's charts. But cracks would start to show in the foundations of the band, with producer, fellow writer, and founder Matthew Fisher leaving the band shortly after a Salty Dog's release. The album would also begin to illuminate the changing styles of Robin Trower, whose tune Crucifixion Land, which also featured a rare early Trower lead vocal, clearly showed the guitarist's move 
towards atmospheric and guitar-driven blues rock. The next two years would see a lot of changes in Proko Harum, with many members moving on to other projects. The man would record a couple more albums, but by 1971, Trower found himself increasingly at odds with the direction of the band, and he would announce his amicable departure. Right before this departure, however, Trower would start a love affair with a Fender Stratocaster that would last a lifetime. Previously, Trower had used various Gibson Les Pauls during his time with Proko Harum, but before a show with fellow prog rockers Jethro Tull, Trower saw Tull guitarists Martin Barr Strat that he used for slide leaning up against an amp, and on a whim, Trower picked up the axe and he instantly remembered that he felt this immediate connection in his head and his heart. He was reported to have yelled, THIS IS IT! at the top of his lungs, and he would race out to buy his own Strat a short time later, never bothering to use another type of guitar for the rest of his life. Trower had amassed a huge backlog of his own tunes in the years leading up to his departure from Proko Harum, but even though his artistic output was stifled in the dynamics of the band, Robin looks back fondly on his days with the band as a time when he learned many lessons about touring, professionalism, and recording. He would take these lessons into a solo career which would span over six decades. Before entering into solo work, he would test the waters with a supergroup featuring ex-Jethro Tull drummer Clive Bunker, ex-Stone the Crows bassist James Dewar, and singer Frankie Miller to create the band Jude, but after a few weeks of rehearsal, the band would split up without recording. Trower wasted no more time in beginning to assemble his band, keeping bass player James Dewar to double as lead vocalist, and hiring drummer Reg Isidore to form the Robin Trower Band. Trower's desire to keep it simple in a power trio setup drew obvious comparisons to the recently departed Jimi Hendrix, comparisons that Trower has welcomed as he considered Hendrix a huge influence and wanted to continue the work that Jimi had started in reinventing electric blues rock. Trower, Dewar, and Isidore would enter the studio in late 1972, along with former Progol bandmate Matthew Fisher as producer, to begin recording Trower's first album, Twice Removed from Yesterday. The album wouldn't move the needle very much commercially, but it would set the stage for Trower's 70 sound, and a couple of tunes from the album would become live staples for Trower's entire career, especially Daydream. Less than a year later, the same lineup would re-enter the studio to begin work on Trower's second album, which would become Robin's most successful and popular work. Bridge of Size would reach number seven in the U.S. album charts and be certified gold, becoming a mainstay of guitar rock fans in the U.S. for many weeks. The album would feature several tracks of foot-stomping old-school blues rock, like Two Rolling Stoned, Little Bit of Sympathy, and Day of the Eagle. But it is the main riff from the dreamy, ethereal title track that most people know as Robin Trower's signature tone. Trower claims he got the title for Bridge of Size when a racehorse's name in the sports section caught his eye. The horse was obviously named after the Venice, Italy landmark, but Trower simply liked the turn of the phrase. Seriously though, if you're looking for a shot of blues rock, told through the lens of psychedelia and guitar tones, a wash with beautifully controlled distortion and effects, you need to give this album a listen cover to cover. Even lesser known tracks like Lady Love and The Fool and Me are just straight out rockers. It is a seriously underrated album of the 70s. As the 1970s wound on, so did Trower's solo career, and all of his albums were mildly successful in the US, UK, and Australia, with Robin enjoying a core of fans that supported his live tours through most of the decade. He would dutifully release one album a year between 1973 and 78. After two albums, Reg Isidore would depart in lieu of new drummer Bill Lorden. In 1977, Dewar would pass the bass playing duties to new member Rusty Allen so he could concentrate on vocals. 1980's Victims of the Fury would be the last album featuring the classic lineup of Trower 70s band, and the new decade of the 80s would bring many changes. The 80s would be arguably Trower's most prolific decade in terms of album releases, but Trower's star was fading as the blues guitar genre was somewhat being replaced by other musical styles in a decade that saw many new frontiers in recording techniques and technology. Despite this, Trower still found success a few times, most notably in his collaboration with former Cream bass player and singer Jack Bruce. The duo, along with Trower's longtime drummer Bill Lorden, would release the album BLT in 1981, which shot to number 37 on the US album charts. The pair would release a second album in 82 called Truce, and again pair up 25 years later in 2007 for Seven Moons for an album and a live show. In the early 90s, Trower would play guitar on two albums by ex-Roxy Music lead singer Brian Ferry 
again working with him later in 2007. All during these collaborations, Trower would continue to release his own solo work dutifully over the span of the next 30 years. To date, Robin has released 24 solo albums, 10 live albums, and 13 compilations, as well as four releases with Jack Bruce and three with Brian Ferry. Truly, one of the hardest working men in show business. Good God. <laughs> Looking back on Robin's legacy, many people often call his work a natural progression to Jimi Hendrix's, but I definitely don't think it's as simple as that. I always looked at Robin Trower as a man with more than two feet because he had a foot in so many different genres at the same time. His mixture of blues, psychedelic rock, progressive rock, and atmospheric playing is unique and recognizable. And his early power trio lineup was good enough to stand with any other trio from around that time, or even earlier, like Cream, the Jimi Hendrix Experience, the James Gang. And he also continued a tradition that would be adopted by future guitar heroes like Steve Ray Vaughan. Another interesting tidbit about Robin's life. Notice I didn't bring up any stories of rock and roll debauchery or drug overdoses. That's right, Robin has been known as the consummate English gentleman, a working man's guitarist who simply puts his head down and makes great music. My kind of guy. The man never burned a musical bridge in his life, often working with band members who have come and gone over many decades. Even though Trower is fiercely independent in his own work, he is also known as a great collaborator and is often a perfect addition as a sideman with a rich buttery tone and an economy of style. There are no reports of Trower having abused drug or alcohol or having been arrested. Robin was even married to his wife Andrea for nearly 50 years before she tragically died of cancer in 2014. Robin is all about the music. It's a refreshing change to focus only on a man's artistic output and less about what happens off the stage. Many guitarists have tried to emulate the sound that Trower coaxes out of his Fender Strats, and part of that is knowing his gear and signal chain. Trower's signature custom shop Fender model features the usual setup, but the pickups are three different versions of the Strat single coil. He uses a 50s reissue in the neck, a 60s reissue in the middle position, and a Texas Special in the bridge for a hotter output. He prefers maple necks, like me, and specifically asked for a 70s style headstock as he felt the extra wood would give the guitars a little extra resonance. Over the years, Trower has tuned down from standard, originally starting in standard, then going half step down, followed by now a full step down for his live shows. He uses 100 watt Marshall JCM 800 and 900s between one and three heads depending on the size of the room and between four and six cabinets. In 1994, he developed a relationship with full tone pedals and has used them exclusively ever since. Currently, he uses the OCD, the Distortion Pro, the Fat Boost, the Clyde Deluxe Wah, the Deja Vibe 2, Soul Bender, and a Boss Chromatic Tuner. Trower said he was born with an artistic engine that has never really failed him or diminished over the years, and so he just keeps making albums. 2019's Coming Closer to the Day saw Trower playing all the instruments on the album, even receiving praise for his bass playing and lead vocals. He didn't play drums, though. Even approaching the young age of 76, Robin Trower shows no signs of slowing down, and I'm sure he's chomping at the bit to get back out on the road once this pandemic is over. I know I'll be checking his websites for tour dates near me. That's our second installment of Forgotten Fretmasters. Remember to subscribe to the channel and drop a like on the video. Also, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button if you would like to be notified whenever the Guitar Historian uploads a new video. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.